Good morning, everyone. Welcome to the Todontal Geometry Colloquium Season 2. This is a weekly a web series all about geometry processing. This colloquium aims at promoting young researchers and researchers from traditionally underrepresented communities. Every week, we will have an opener talking about their cutting edge research for 10 minutes, followed by a headliner giving us a keynote presentation. Today, we are thrilled to have Marek Vrochna as our opener to talk about his latest paper, Monster Mesh, and Yotam Gingol to talk, talk about color and geometry. Uh, you can leave all your questions in the YouTube chat. And as a new feature of uh, season two of our colloquium, we've, we've started a Discord server. Uh, usually when you ask questions in the YouTube chat, sometimes um, there are some questions we can't get to or, there, or someone wants to have a longer discussion with one of the speakers. So that's the reason we started this channel. So you, you can also ask questions on our Discord server in the channel that we've set up for this talk and we will also be monitoring that. I'll, set a, I'll post a link to the Discord server in the YouTube chat. So let's move on to our first speaker. Dr. Marek Voroshna is a collaborator at Google and the Czech Technical University in Prague. I have to admit, I'm really excited that he's joining us today to present one of my favorite SIGGRAPH Asia papers. I can't say it's my favorite because um, everyone in this Zoom call has had a SIGGRAPH Asia 2020 paper, but Marek and I know the truth. Um, Dr. Voroshna will present his work Monster Mash on sketch-based modeling and animation of 3D shapes. He will probably tell you this himself, but just in case, know that they actually have a demo of their project online where you can sketch and animate your own most monster. I will link to it in the YouTube chat and on Discord, and I really recommend that you try it out. But I'll, I'll stop hyping this talk and let him do it himself so you can take it away, Mark. Okay, so thank you. Thanks a lot for the introduction, and I will now try to share my screen. Okay. Okay, that's it. Okay, so um, yes, yeah, so I will talk about Monster Mesh, uh, which is uh, a joint work uh, uh, with uh, Daniel Sikora and myself from Czech Technical University in Prague, uh, Cassidy Curtis and David Salasin from Google Research, Brian Curtis from Google Research and University of Washington, and Olga Sorkin Hornung from ETH Zurich. So uh, you probably know that uh, the creation of 3D content is hard and what is even harder is the creation of uh, 3D animated content. Uh, one reason for this is that uh, traditional modeling and animation interfaces are really complicated and the whole process basically uh, requires a lot of effort and some expert knowledge as well. We dreamed of a uh, casual modeling and animation interface that can look like this. The user can simply sketch a character in uh, uh, like a single, from single viewpoint. This input is then uh, immediately converted into, uh, into a 3D model that can be immediately animated simply by, simply by grabbing uh, uh, parts and recording their movements basically. There is some previous work that already tried to tackle these problems. One of uh, the first ones is Teddy, which allowed user to create a, a round textured model simply by uh, drawing in uh, from like multiple uh, camera viewpoints. One of the uh, recent follow-ups on Teddy is RigMesh, which in addition to modeling also simplifies uh, model rigging and therefore the animation. One drawback of these approaches at, is that uh, they uh, require the user to uh, work in the 3D domain and to rotate the model basically. Uh, user also has to, if they want to create a model like, uh, uh, like this, uh, they have to like carefully think about the structure in advance. Our approach is even simpler. We let the user to work entirely in the 2D domain and there is no rigging required. So in our approach, user can just draw uh, a model part by part by sketching it. This sketch then uh, gets uh, immediately inflated into a soft deformable uh, 3D model that can be uh, simply animated just by placing control pins and moving them around and recording their position. Okay, so now let's have a, a closer look or how this works. 
uh, we, uh, now let's let's suppose that uh, we want to create uh, a model of elephant like this. Uh, we assume that uh, the uh, output model is round and that it may uh, be composed of several parts that uh, are smoothly connected together. We actually uh, let the user to do this decomposition into parts, but from the user point of view, this is a, a really simple talk, a simple talk task. Okay, so uh, the user can start by uh, drawing a body like this uh, with uh, this uh, like a closed curve. Then she can draw some parts uh, like these legs that should be in front or behind. And uh, typically when a user draws uh, an open curve, that means that this region should be smoothly connected to the other region it, uh, it overlaps. There may be some uh, regions like, uh, like, uh, like these ears, for example, that have the same shape from both sides. So in this case, we just give the user an option to uh, create a symmetric duplicate. Okay, so uh, this is almost everything the user has to do. And now our system takes this input, converts it into uh, flat regions. And since we know uh, the, the uh, partial ordering of the strokes, we can reconstruct this total ordering and use it in later steps. We then uh, triangulate this, these flat meshes and we are almost ready for inflating this into 3D. But before doing so, we have to assure that uh, this mesh has a correct topology that will result in a coherent model uh, after the inflation. So uh, in order to do so, we first have to uh, basically do some topological uh, interconnection. We start by identifying uh, connection curves. Uh, in this case, we know that uh, the leg A was drawn as an open curve. That th this means that it should be connected to the body B smoothly along the green line. And these connection curves may be easily ident identified. These are just the missing parts of uh, the open curves. Uh, I won't go into much detail now. Uh, you can uh, uh, find more details about how this is performed in our supplementary material, but this is just a simple illustration, which is simplified. There are uh, like uh, two regions, the leg and the body on the left side and on the right side, you can see actually the flat, the flat regions. And uh, so I will just skip this and uh, so, after this topological interconnection process, we are left with a correct topology that can be uh, inflated to, to 3D. So to actually to inflate it, we use uh, a, a previous work by Sikora et al. that is uh, able to perform elliptical inflation by solving a Poisson equation and square rooting. Uh, this uh, method actually requires some parts or some vertices of the mesh to be rooted at the Z0 plane. And this is how uh, the, the resulting uh, surface may look like. And this is how it looks like in 3D. So you can see that it's nice and round, but it has some interpenetrations. And this is uh, caused by uh, this uh, condition of that uh, inflation method, that some parts needs to be rooted at Z0 plane. Okay, so to resolve this, we introduce some other layering constraints. Uh, in this case, we know uh, that uh, leg A should be in front of uh, the body B, and we know these conditions for all, all the parts. Basically, this is derived uh, from the user input, and this is how the conditions may look from the, from the side view. They may take a form of uh, either equalities or inequalities, and uh, basically, the uh, the, the ideal result would be to uh, deform this uh, initial inflation uh, smoothly so that it also satisfies these, uh, these conditions. So in order to do this, we came up with ARAP-L deformation model, uh, which stands for as rigid as possible layered, which is basically a combination of uh, standard ARAP deformation model by Sorkin and Alexa uh, and these inequality constraints. 
So once we solve this problem, the, uh, uh, the mesh can look like this from the side view. And it can look like this uh, from uh, in, in 3D, basically. So you can see that uh, the interpenetrations are resolved. A nice thing about this ARAP L deformation is that it also allows a simple extension with additional positional constraints. In this case, the user may simply add handles uh, onto the model and deform it in uh, ARAP style. Okay, so before concluding, I would like to show you some uh, other examples. And, but I would also like to point out that there is a project web page. Uh, we released a demo that you can uh, run in your browser. And we recently also released a source code for the demo. So uh, now I would like to uh, show you some examples in this web-based demo. So we can start with some simple things like uh, uh, creating a walking ball. So I will just create a circle like this. I can inflate it to see how it looks. Okay. Then I can try to add some limbs like this. You can see that I started uh, uh, drawing inside and I created like this open curve, which means that there should be uh, a seamless interconnection in this area. So let's inflate it. Okay, so this is how it looks like. I think we would like to have two legs. So let's just duplicate it. Okay. We can also try to uh, uh, animate it quickly. So let's just place some control pins on the legs and record the position of these control pins. Okay, so we have one leg moving and then we can uh, copy this trajectory to the other leg, to the other control point, just align it and shift it by approximately 50%, something like this maybe. Okay, it works. We can now uh, go back to the drawing mode and try to add some ears. And see how it looks. Yeah, so you can see that this animation was preserved, but the model was enhanced with these ears. There are also some other models available in the help. Uh, there is an example gallery from which you can just choose a, a model you like. Let's try this uh, uh, example of uh, boxing characters. Yeah, and I think that's it. This concludes my talk. So thank you for your time. Thank you very much, Marek. That was, I, I, it took me a while uh, to say it, I think, because I was still amazed by how cool your animations look. And that was a live demo, by the way, that we just had. Um, okay, so uh, let's go from one exciting talk to another exciting talk. Our headline speaker today is Professor Jotam Gingold. Now I am meeting Professor Gingold for the first time, but rather I should say that he is meeting me for the first time because in reality, I feel like I know him very well already. This is because as some of you know, my PhD advisor is Professor Alec Jacobson. And every time Alec uh, says some uh, funny anecdote, it starts with, so I was talking to Jotam the other day, or you know what Jotam always says. So I feel like I know, uh, I feel like I know him already very well. I'm eager to hear him present for the first time. Uh, it's very hard for me to summarize the very, very broad span of work. You know, Professor Gingold's work in computer graphics and in geometry. But today he will be focusing on his work on visualizing and doing traditional geometry processing, but on the color space of an image. A very uh, neat, surprising idea that also makes for very cool applications. I won't do as good a summary as he will, so I won't take any of his time. Uh, you can take it away, Professor Yeton Gengel. Thank you. Uh, so let me share my screen and here we go. Yeah, thank you very much, uh, Sylvia, Derek, Eris, uh, for having me here. And uh, thank you, uh, Mark, for a very interesting talk. Uh, yeah, so um, without any further ado, I, I'd like to tell you about some, uh, some work I've done with color and geometry. 
Um, so let's see. So uh, yeah, I'm uh, I direct the Creativity and Graphics Lab at George Mason University, and generally interested in all kinds of things, design and sculpting and drawing and painting and occasionally singing. But today. Uh, I want to talk about color and uh, geometry, and I'm not going to have time to talk about uh, all of this work, but I do want to point out uh, that one of these works uh, was actually a collaboration with Mark, who we just saw. So there's there's Mark showing up uh, again. Um, and uh, all of these works were uh, the work of my graduate student, uh, Jan Chao Tan, who's since graduated. But uh, another way to say this is I'm just going to be presenting the work of my graduate student, uh, which is what I do as a professor. So uh, thank you, Jan Chao, for doing all the hard work that I get to present. Uh, OK, so I'm, I'm primarily going to focus on uh, these two works. Uh, um, but to tell you how we got into this color and geometry, uh, we were, we were, um, at, uh, uh, I'd like to give you some background, right? So, uh, digital paintings, uh, are often, we, you know, we see them as these colorful images. They're very, uh, they're very colorful. They look, you know, they have these different, uh, uh, effects on them, like shading and so on. And ultimately they're, they're often composed of these different layers. Artists use these layers to organize their images, to organize their work. And what are these layers? Each layer is essentially a translucent image. Right? So each uh, layer is a, is, a, is, a, is a pixel bitmap of pixels, and the pixels all have uh, transparency. Okay, so uh, in the real world, people will, will paint paintings. And when they paint paintings in the real world, they're, they're not obviously using uh, uh, layers that, that composite translucently. Um, there are models to model how paint mixes and how paint layers involving light, which uh, transmits and reflects off of objects. Uh, and ultimately gives us an, you know, uh, uh, an image that we can represent with red, green, and blue values, red, green, and blue channels. Um, uh, but one interesting thing about the way artists paint is they, they have to start with some physical materials, some pigments, which they then mix uh, and then paint with. So this is kind of interesting. Uh, and we can think about photographs, which are just samplings of the real world, natural images. And uh, certainly these weren't painted uh, with pigments in the, in the artistic sense. Um, but they're also uh, interesting to think of in that uh, in that uh, framework. So we got onto this uh, line of work uh, a number of years ago, I guess five or six years ago, and this is the work that uh, Mark uh, uh, was a collaborator with. Uh, and the 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 starting point was that physical paintings are are hard to edit. We don't have these layers, which are so useful and convenient to organize and to edit our image with. And so we asked the question, what if we had a time-lapse video of the creation of this painting? So here, uh, here is, we can see the artist is painting over time. We've got the camera fixed on the canvas. And what additional information uh, do we have from this? And um, to show you, you know, what we might like to get is we might like to get this kind of layering uh, where the, uh, the layers will, trans, will com composite uh, translucently. Um, Mark created this video. I have to give him additional credit because that's, it's, it's, it's like, my the favorite video I've ever I've ever made, and I didn't make it. Mark made it. Uh, and so the, the the question that we ask ourselves, the, the kind of question is: so we 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 can look at any two frames in our image, and we can look at a pixel in these two frames before and after a change, and we can say what 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 happened in this change? What happened to this pixel? And we can ask this question: what does this look like geometrically in color space? And we, so we use RGB color space. It's a three dimensional color space. All of our uh, color spaces are three-dimensional because of our human visual system is uh, three-dimensional. And so here we're plotting a, a, a RGB color space as a cube. You can think of uh, the three X, Y, and Z axes as red, green, and blue. And what we, uh, we can take these pixels and we can say, well, the, the pixel in the image earlier in time, the before pixel has a location, a 3D location, and the pixel afterwards has a 3D location. And uh, the change, the paint, which had to be applied to make the pixel change its appearance from before to after must lie along this line. Uh, and why that is, uh, we'll, we'll get more into, but that's, this was our, this was our kind of a geometric, you know, our first geometric look at what's happening in, in color, uh, in images. And so then we asked ourselves after we, after we did that work, what if you only have a single image? Uh, and so this, this, uh, this brings us to, uh, these, these two papers I want to spend some time on, which are about uh, palette-based decomposition and recoloring of an image, a single image, using color space geometry. 
And so here we are again with our uh, digital painting. Okay, and so let's 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 look very carefully at, at the effects of, of uh, single strokes. So we have a canvas; it's a blank canvas, and the artist draws a stroke. We have this green stroke, and then the artist draws another stroke, and another stroke, and another stroke. And what we've you know what we have is we know we have this this ordered layer, and each layer is a single color, so we can think of it as a coat of paint, and we can think of our pigments now as being these these colors the artist has used. And we know that when we take these translucent images and we overlay them on each other, we get the image that we see, that we like, that we're very happy with. And, uh, and it's convenient. We can, do things, uh, we can do things like change the colors afterwards, right? Even though yellow is on top, we can change the colors of the strokes underneath because, uh, because we have them on their own isolated layers and we can just change the color. Or we can insert objects in between them because we have this, uh, this ordering, this total ordering. Uh, the problem is that images in the wild, if you go and you find an image or if you, you, take a, you, 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 uh, you scan an image, you, you, you find an image, it doesn't have these layers. So the challenge we can ask ourselves is, can we decompose this image into these layers uh, which, re which reproduce the original image? And there's sort of two sub problems here that we will break this down into. And the first one is uh, what coats of paint, what should the colors be for these coats of paint? And then how much of that paint should we apply at every pixel? And this sort of problem has been looked at. So this uh, you know, creating palettes from images is something that's been looked at for a while. Um, a very influential work uh, was uh, in 2015, palette-based photo recoloring, where they, 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 uh, they, they asked themselves, well, maybe we can, we can find a palette from an image and use it to, to change the colors in an image. There was no layer decomposition happening, but this has been very influential. Um, and another set of works that are very related are image matting, where people say, hey, maybe we can, we can uh, take a foreground and a background and separate them. And recently, um, yeah, Isaac, sorry, did some very nice works uh, about unmixing uh, uh, images into these kind of soft matted layers. So there's more than just a foreground and a background. Now it's a, it's a bunch of layers, but the layers aren't, they're not single colors. They're not coats of paint. And it's not, it's not quite the, the layer, um, the over operation, the kind of uh, layer ordering. Um, that a lot of these do, but this is still a very, very nice work. Okay, so to, to tackle this problem, let's 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 look at this from a geometric point of view because that's uh, that's what uh, you've been promised, and that's what um, I've promised. Okay, so here's our image compositing. Uh, here's our the color we had before and the color we have after when a new layer is applied. Um, uh, uh, and and the paint color, let's say, is blue, and the blue color um, has a certain translucency. Which is what which is what allows us to some of the color underneath to shine through, and that translucency we usually use alpha uh, uh, to represent that amount of tra translucency. Okay, and so here's here now I'm going to show you what I showed you earlier, but now I'm also going to show you with with an RGB color space what's happening. So we can see as these layer as these strokes are applied on the top left we are seeing. Uh, we're seeing you know, the image and we're seeing each stroke applied. And on the right, we're seeing all of the pixels in the image. So every pixel, let's say this is a you know, thousand by thousand uh, image. So these are the million pixels. Each pixel has a location in RGB space. And so when it's a white background, it's a, when the white background, all those pixels show up in the, in the, in the top right corner, one, one, one. White is a, a even mixture of red, green, and blue. Uh, once gr green is applied, we see this there's some green pixels and, uh, and the green and the white blend together. So we see this line between green and white. And as we add another color, we take this line and we add a third color. Now we see a triangle. Now there's a triangle of colors, which is the blend of some of the, the green pixels are blending with the purple and uh, some of the white pixels are blending with the purple. And so as each, uh, as each new uh, layer is applied or as each new pigment is applied or as each new color is used, we're adding another vertex to this shape. And the space of possible colors uh, inside of the, in the image have to lie inside of this convex shape. And so this is true for digital paintings, uh, which are created with this, with this, that color compositing operation uh, that I, uh, that we looked at. And here is a, here's a digital painting um, created by Danny Jones. And we can see the colors of the image. And I'm showing you sort of a convex outline, a convex uh, structure around these pixels. And so you can see yeah, all the pixels lie inside of this. I mean, they, 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 they have to. Now here's a natural image. This is a photograph. Uh, this photograph, nobody painted this. 
uh, this is this is this is just what's out there in the real world. And even and even here, we can we can put a convex structure around it. Nothing stopping us from putting a convex structure around a set of points. And uh, and now we know that that all of the the colors which appear in this image lie inside of this convex structure. So there must be a way to create them by mixing the vertices of this convex structure. Okay, so here's a, here's a geometric interpretation of that compositing equation. Now we have many layers. Uh, that nice, very simple linear interpolation uh, becomes a pretty, becomes a pretty, has a pretty gnarly algebraic uh, expression. This is like the repeated application of uh, compositing multiple colors. But geometrically, we can just look at it and we can say, you know what? There's a convex, there's a convex shape here, uh, and uh, some blend of these, uh, of these, uh, of these vertices or some path towards each of these vertices will lead us to the color. So this brings us to. Uh, uh, a kind of a pipeline, an algorithm that we can use to tackle this problem, as I promised. So we have our input image, and uh, we can take, we can work backwards now by taking the colors of this image and computing a convex hull. And then we can simplify this convex hull because the actual convex hull, for various reasons, maybe because of uh, noise and other reasons, is too complicated. We can simplify it. And now, once we have those vertices, we have, uh, we know what the what the colors we want to use are. We know what the palette of this image is. And now our job is to uh, find how much of those colors should be should be applied at each pixel. So to, to compute those alpha values, those transparency values, which will recover the image. And then finally, we can uh, we can profit from this. We can um, we can uh, edit the image by uh, recoloring. By manipulating those colors and other things, so let's let's get into it. So um, yeah, palette selection. So here's the here's here's a here's an image, and in this image, I very carefully uh, did not include any blue. So now we can think of a two D color space, which is just red and green because there's no blue. And if we take this is an illustration, by the way, this is not exactly the pixels on the left. This is an illustration. So if we take these pixels and we look at them in color space. Um, uh, if we try to use clustering to try to find uh, a nice palette, when we when we do our clustering, we'll get uh, three colors. Let's say we so we want three colors to edit it with. We'll get these three colors, and by by its very nature, clustering is sort of the uh, the the cluster center is the average of of the pixels in the cluster. So we're going to get colors which lie inside here. On the other hand, if we take a convex hull, it'll be too complex. We'll have like five vertices. Um, but the key is if we can simplify this convex hull somehow. Uh, like uncutting off corners, then we can end up with a uh, like recovering the hidden colors which actually uh, were used to create this image. So that's our that's our insight uh, and that's our goal here. And so here is the convex hull in RGB space for that very clean image. This was made with very clean data, and we can see it's quite gnarly. And that gnarliness comes from uh, um, uh, quantization artifacts for, uh, mostly. Uh huh. Um, and so what we do here to simplify it is we use uh, edge collapse. Everybody likes edge collapse when simplifying shapes. So we use edge collapse. Now we have to be a little bit careful. We want our edge collapse. Uh, whenever we collapse edges uh, on our shape, we want to make sure that the simplified convex hull still encloses all of the vertices. So there's an, um, an algorithm out there, the progressive hull method, which just adds some constraints uh, um, when uh, collapsing an edge to make sure that the vertex uh, the new position of the vertex still makes sure that the that it that uh, any that the uh, anything that was inside the convex hull or the shape before is still inside, and so here's uh, here's here's that's that's what we do, and we get this very nice simplified convex hull. Important question: Do we simplify it? Um, this is uh, this is uh, here we can we can we, we can see what this looks like. So here's our original convex hull, and here it is simplified to nine vertices. Now. You know why not use the original convex hull and all of the vertices? There's just so many. There's so many vertices. It would be very tedious for somebody to work with that many layers, especially when the colors are so similar. So instead, what we can do is uh, we can use, uh, we, you know, so we'll simplify. And is nine enough? Well, nine is, you know, it's kind of a lot. Maybe if it needed it, it would be fine. But but nine seems like kind of a lot. So let's look at eight. And that's still that looks still quite reasonable. We've got a blue. We've got a red and orange. Uh, white and black. Here's seven. Uh, here's six. Uh, here's five, and uh, here's four. Now four looks like it's too much. It's too far, right? So a lot of the blue colors are now outside of the convex hull, so we can no longer reproduce the blue colors in this image. Uh, so four is too much. 
So, uh, so I like five, let's use five. Now, ultimately this is something, you know, if you're using this uh, tool to, to edit your images, you can choose, you can choose how many colors you want. Um, uh, but uh, an automatic way to choose this would be to just say, uh, uh, how much error you're willing to tolerate. And if you're uh, willing to tolerate, you know, not very much error, then you would choose five vertices. Okay, and here's a kind of a real example comparing the clustering. So here's an image uh, and here's what uh, a, a clustering based method finds for the palette. The, the colors are inside of the, the palette colors are inside of the pixel colors. Okay, so um, now, now that we have our palette, we have to decide what to do with, you know, what to do with it, how to create our layers. And so uh, I'm going to tell you about uh, two different ways to, uh, two different approaches to, to, to uh, for compositing. Now, the one that we looked at, the, the uh, linear mixing, the linear interpolation, this so-called over, quarter def over blending operation, um, that is, has an ordered, that has ordered layers. And so here's our input image. Now we have our palette, but we need to pick a palette order. Uh, and different orderings uh, will give you different, you know, or different, right? There's, and there's many different orderings here, uh, a lot of different orderings. Um, I don't know of a way to, uh, to automatically pick a good order. Um, we looked at this problem and we weren't able to find something um, very satisfying. Uh, so that's, that's sort of an open question. Um, so we let the user choose. So if the user chooses a palette order, then uh, um, we still have infinite paths. And so let's, let's visualize this geometrically. So here, is our, uh, here are the five vertices in our palette. We have C0, C1, C2, C3, and C4. And we have a, a color inside, this color P. Now, what does it mean to, to be applying paint in this order? So what does it mean to be, to be applying uh, coats of paint in, in the order C0, C1, C2, C3, C4? Well, it means that first we're gonna apply some red, and then we're gonna apply some green, and then we're gonna apply some blue, and then we're gonna apply some yellow, okay? Now, uh, even with this order, we could apply a different amount of red, a different amount of green, a different amount of blue, and a different amount of yellow, and still reach the same point. And uh, one way to sort of recursively see that there's infinitely, still infinite, infinitely many paths is here's our two, here are two paths, and any point that was made by compositing the first four layers, C0 through C3, uh, will lie, can, can, uh, can lie on this, this gray line. Any point which lies on this gray line here uh, can then be mixed with a little bit of yellow to, to achieve the color that we're looking for. So there's, that's, a, you know, that's a line segment and there's infinitely many points on that line segment. So all we have to do with the first four layers is get to any point on that line segment. There's infinitely many of those. And then of course, once you're at that point, uh, once you pick a point on that line segment, you, you, have, you can recursively do the same, uh, same uh, exercise and say, well, now there's infinitely many uh, uh, points on the line which will uh, arrive at this point using only the three previous layers. So we have infinitely many paths. So how do we choose one? We'll, we'll use uh, spatial smoothness and sparsity. Uh, and and uh, I'll show you why these are, uh, these are important. Okay, so uh, here is the problem that we solve. So we have our color palette, we have our layer order, and let's minimize an energy. Uh, so let's find a unique compositing path by minimizing an energy. And so we'll, we'll construct an, an optimization in terms of the opacity of every layer. And first of all, we want to reconstruct the image. So we want the original image and the reconstructed image to be very similar. So we can, uh, we can just use a squared um, L2 norm and say, okay, the, 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 uh, the, the, the image we get by reconstructing, by compositing our layer should look, should, should look like it did to begin with. Uh, now we want uh, oh, sparsity. We want per pixel sparsity. Uh, and so we add a term to, uh, for sparsity. This is also a quadratic term, but it's negative definite, unfortunately. Um, and uh, finally, we will add a spatial smoothness. So all other things being equal, we would rather have uh, some smoothness, some spatial coherence to our layers. Okay, and so uh, these two, these two uh, sparsity and smoothness terms kind of regularize the, the solution space, help us pick something from the solution space. And the results of doing this over compositing, this order dependent compositing, here's an image uh, that we saw earlier. And now in my presentation software, I'm gonna click a button and we're gonna see it 
un decompose into its constituent layers. And uh, this, the, the image, in fact, the image we just saw was uh, not the original image, but that was our result. And this transformation that we saw, this animation was done in this software. And the reason I'm uh, emphasizing that is that over compositing is, is supported everywhere. It's so standard. It's in, you know, it's in Keynote, it's in PowerPoint, it's in your web browser. When you, when you have a translucent image or color in your web browser, it's, these are all using this uh, over compositing. So, um, uh, so this, this, this effect is not a recorded video. This is just my presentation software can do this. And in my presentation software, I can add some more uh, images, some birds, and then I can uh, just, you know, put the birds in place and then ask my presentation software to do a, uh, to, to just translate the, and scale the images. And we see these birds are now, some one of them is behind the moon, one of them is behind the bird, but above the clouds. One of them is behind these uh, colorful dots in the corner. Uh, here's another example, um, uh, Michelle Lee artwork, and we can see uh, some butterflies behind the haze, behind the hair. Um, and some other thing we can do since we have these, these layers, uh, we, can, we can paint on them, they're, they're spatial layers. So we, we, can, we can take a layer and we can add, you know, we can recolor part of it uh, and then uh, change the color of the boat just by changing the entire color of that layer and get this modified image where now the boat is green and the, um, uh, this kind of ladder or whatever that is, is purple. Um, so uh, there's another nice connection here with geometry, which is generalized barycentric coordinates. Those are also a coordinate system inside of a shape. And so if you, you, you come with, uh, with, a, with a shape uh, and you take the vertices of that shape, uh, we can refer to any point like this point P as the weighted uh, average of the vertices. And so the relationship here uh, between generalized barycentric coordinates and alpha compositing is it's, it's in the, the weights and those alpha values. So we have weights versus opacities. Uh, and um, there's, it's, you can uniquely go from these layers into generalized barycentric coordinates. So in some sense, we have a new generalized barycentric coordinate scheme. Um, going the other way around is ambiguous. Um, why is it ambiguous? You essentially get a divide by zero whenever there's uh, some opaque parts in a, in a layer. So this is what we're seeing here. So here are mean value coordinates and local barycentric coordinates. And here's, you know, our, these are our layers. So the reason you see these, uh, this, this kind of noise uh, in the generalized barycentric coordinates is that those are completely covered by uh, later layers, by layers on top. Uh, so uh, there's sort of, you know, in, anything could be there uh, in the layer. Anything is a valid solution that manifests as a divide by zero in the equations. Um, another uh, effect is that uh, because we have we ask for spatial smoothness, we kind of fill in this uh, this layer, uh, the blue stroke. Okay, uh, so now that if we're using our uh, our transparencies as as if we convert these to very generalized very center coordinates, we can actually go back to our RGB color space. And we can uh, just move these vertices in color space and recolor the image. So here we're, we're recoloring this image by uh, reconstructing it using generalized barycentric coordinates. And here's another example. Uh, we can um, take this image and we can recolor it by just moving you know, the green node, changing the color of the green node, and now the grass is kind of brown, or, or change the color of the, the um, clothing, and, and, uh, and, and, and that appears in the image. So this is our approach also working on natural images. Uh, and here's, you know, here's the decomposition into layers of, these natural, of this natural image, this photograph, uh, recomposed again in this presentation software. Um, and just to show you kind of a comparison with uh, some of these other uh, classic generalized barycentric coordinates, one thing that we see here that's, that's, uh, is that if we change one color, so this, we change this blue to this uh, kind of bright um, pink, I guess. Um, we, we see that the, the clothing, which was quite clearly uh, bluish, has changed to pink. Uh, and in the other very center coordinate approaches, the chair has become uh, quite pink as well and kind of like undesirably so. Uh, and so that, that's a manifestation of sparsity. You know, we really do want um, our colors to be as sparse as possible. Yeah, and uh, you might also you know, notice some other effects you don't want, like pink showing up in the hair. 
Okay, so now let's say you don't care about uh, about the about the layer order. Maybe you don't need compatibility with presentation software and browsers, and really you're interested in in recoloring. Um, so uh, then we can we can we can use uh, additive mixing. We can just purely go for this kind of generalized barycentric coordinate approach and say, you know what, I I, I really I just want um, uh, I just I just want to have uh, I just want to have weights per pixel uh, in terms of this palette color. And, uh, and, and that's all I really care about. Okay, so should you use our approach? Well, uh, sure, yeah, you should definitely use, use our approach. Um, but uh, what, what are the drawbacks, right? So, uh, so we, we worked in RGB space and RGB space is, you know, it's, it's nice, it's very colorful and we have this optimization approach, but the you know, problem with optimization is uh, scalability. It, it actually could be, you know, kind of lengthy to solve this problem. It's, uh, uh, there's some parameters to tune the weights of the different the different regularization term terms, um, and you maybe you can't handle all examples with with the same parameters. Uh, you know, we we found some parameters which worked well for a lot of examples, but you know, there's still scalability issues, and and maybe not always. Uh, yeah, um, and this example is showing that like the the hand uh, was not included in the same layer um, as the as the the forearm and so that's sort of like okay maybe we need to put a little more weight on the on the spatial smoothness okay so let's try let's not use optimization then what what else can we do uh let's turn to generalized barycentric coordinates okay so there's some schemes for doing this um what, what can they give us well one issue they give us uh, they don't give us is spatial smoothness so they will be smooth in color space but they will not be smooth in image space and you can see kind of on the uh maybe you can see um on the 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 pants here that there's this kind of speckling artifact there uh it's not spatially smooth but it is fast and there are no parameters to tune so uh so what uh can, you know can we get the the best of both worlds uh let's try so let's so so let's rule out RGB space because we can't we can't do optimization and we can't use generalized barycentric coordinates uh, just in RGB space because we want to have spatial smoothness. But let's look at our goal. Let's go back to our original goal. So our original goal was we have this palette and we want to find mixing weights that will give us this image. Okay, so here's the image and each pixel in this image gives us you know a point in RGB space. Uh, but each pixel also gives us a a, um, a color. Uh, sorry, each pixel also gives us a location. We already have our color. Now we also have a location. So we have RGB and now we have XY. So there's another two dimensions we could use. So now we can say, oh, you know what? Each pixel is, a, is five dimensional. It's RGB, XY. Uh, and RGB, XY also has a notion. We can do our convex hull in RGB, XY space. It's very hard to visualize. I can't visualize a five dimensional um, uh, convex hull or five dimensional geometry very well. But, uh, some of the, but I can show you which vertices were used. Uh, as the RGBXY comics hall. And there's a lot, there's a lot, not a huge number, you know, maybe a thousand, two thousand. Uh, here they are, here are the, the, the pixel, here are the colors, and up above you can see the spatial location as well. These are all of the um, pixels that are chosen as the RGBXY comics hall vertices. Um, uh, uh, and at the same time, let's also look at what the RGB palette, uh, let's look at that RGB palette, which was a simplified convex hall in RGB space. There's a very nice property here, which is that all of the RGB XY convex hull vertices actually lie inside of the RGB convex hull and the simplified convex hull because the simplified convex hull still encloses all the original points. So, uh, so that's interesting to us because we know that the RGB palette in color space contains all of the RGB XY convex hull vertices and each of these, and the RGBXY convex hull vertices as a convex hull also contains all of the pixels in the image. Uh, so our goal, our original goal was to get mixing weights W, which go from the RGB palette all the way to the image. But now what we're looking, now, now what we see is maybe we can do a two level decomposition. We can first compute some weights that go from uh, the image to, in terms of the RGBXY convex hull vertices and we get some weights, RGB XY weights. And then, uh, uh, and let me, tell you, let me tell you about that. Yeah, so, uh, so let's look at uh, uh, like, how should we break this down? How should we pick some weights in RGB XY space? Well, one thing we can do is we can do a Delaunay tessellation that's well-defined uh, still in RGB in five-dimensional space. It's well-defined in any dimension. Um, if we do that, 
then that will decompose our uh, our convex uh, our convex hull. It'll decompose the interior into uh, into sim five D simplices, uh, and these and these five D simplices have six points. I had to count there for a second because I thought for a minute that like are there only five points on screen? Uh, there, there are six points here, and all the, and some of the image pixels will lie inside uh, in color. I'm, this is color. I'm I'm showing you. Um, on the right here, this is like a zoom in on a part of color space. I'm not trying to visualize five dimensions. Um, but the, so a simplex in uh, five dimensions has six vertices and we can visualize the edges of those simplex by projecting them to RGB. And we can see, you know, we've got all these little points, uh, these pixels inside and a simplex has a very well-defined, we don't need generalized very centric coordinates for a simplex, we just have very centric coordinates. Great, so now we have our very centric mixing weights so we've solved our, uh, our, for those weights. And uh, we know how to do, uh, uh, you know, now we need to get weights for the, uh, just the RGBXY vertices in RGB space. And here uh, we, you know, we can decompose this also into, uh, we could say, let's say we do a Delaunay tessellation. We can also tessellate this, uh, this convex shape into simplices and take the uh, RGBXY vertices inside. And we could do that and we could assign colors using uh, just very centric mixing weights again. One thing about these mixing weights is they're as sparse as, as possible. There's, you know, there's only, you know, any point in general needs to be, uh, uh, can you know, in general has four weights, uh, no more than four weights. Now, if we do a Delaunay tessellation, Delaunay tessellation by default will, will not want to create very long edges. So in this case, say it would create an edge between yellow and blue. And an edge between yellow and blue um, uh, has this funny property that like gray colors, a gray color might be represented in terms of the blend between red, uh, between yellow and blue. And that can be undesirable. Uh, I'll, I'll show you an example um, because uh, let's say you change a blue color, suddenly a gray pixel becomes colorful. That's kind of undesirable. So, uh, so this line of grays is perceptually very important. So we will create it. So we, we create it. We just say, you know what? Always connect the darkest color to the lightest color. And then, uh, and since this is a convex, um, since it's a co convex polyhedron, you can just tessellate around that, the star, so-called star tessellation, or at least we call it that. And uh, just to show you what this looks like, here's you know, some images and their color distributions. Here's the Delaunay and here's the star um, uh, tessellation. And here we're changing blue to green. And, uh, and you can see that like this, this, this gray coat and the, the, the gray and black hat become green. And that's undesirable. And down here on the um, for the boat image, uh, the back, you know, the gray trees and the gray water becomes purple. So that's it. Now we have our two uh, weights. Uh, we can multiply them to get our final weights. Uh, these weights on the right are fixed. They never change, right? They're 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 uh, like a, a property of the image. No matter what your palette is, they don't change. The the RGB weights that go uh, are based on the RGB palette, so they change, um, but uh, interestingly, updating WRGB is independent of the image size because there's always about one to 2,000 uh, RGBXY vertices. It's, 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 it's not dependent on the image size. Uh, it's, it, the colorfulness of the pixels of the image uh, determine how many RGBXY convex hull vertices there are. And that's not dependent on the size of the image, it's just dependent on the colors of the image. Uh, so one of the things we can do that other methods can't do is if the palette changes, uh, you just need to recompute uh, WRGB. And that's just, a, there's a very small number of points. The, the comics hall, RGBXY Comix hall is a small number of points. This is a small thing to update. So just to show you some running time comparisons, like these other methods, uh, you know, maybe have uh, this big linear scaling or kind of a quadratic scaling if we adapt, uh, uh, you know, our, the work I just showed you or Axoy's work or some other work. Um, our approach, this convex hull, like they're very optimized approaches for convex hull. And if you do that pre-computation and you change the palette, you get the change for like free. I mean, I'm trying to highlight the zero here. You know, we can handle hundred megapixel images and you can do real time editing of the palette. And uh, it's 48 lines of Python code. You just need a star coordinate, star tessellation and uh, Delaunay coordinates in, in, in RGBXY space. And this is it, 48 lines of Python. This is not the simplification of the convex hull. That's not in this code, but th that's, this is the, the weight computation. Uh, so here's a demo. Um, this is showing you creating layers from scratch. So we're gonna be you know, creating layers and you'll see in real time 
uh, the layers themselves um, uh, updating here. So we are doing a real, you know, real-time decomposition uh, as the palette changes. And here's another example where we start with an automatic palette and we say, you know what, like this color, the Simplified Comics hull kind of made this color pretty far out there. Uh, so let's bring it in. Let's make it exactly the background color and our weights will become sparser as a result. And similarly with the hair, let's bring that color in. Let's bring that, that vertex in. It's, you know, it's not, it's no longer strictly enclosing, but it's, uh, it's, you know, we're missing a few, a few pixels there, you know, for the signature, but we don't really notice that difference. Um, and it's hard for the, the algorithm to make that choice for us, but we can do it. And what do you get if you have a better decomposition? Well, uh, if you, if we have a better, if we have a, uh, a better decomposition and we edit the palette, we can change the purple haze to a yellow haze and the background doesn't change, whereas it does with this automatic palette. And similarly, the, you know, um, uh, yeah. And similarly, we can change the, the hair color. Yeah. Okay. So, um, you know, some open questions. Can we make this even faster? Can we do parallel convex hulls of convex hulls or use super pixels? How to make the convex hull, the simplified convex hull more robust? An interesting approach was published um, two years ago, uh, which was, you know, did some iterative optimizations on that, but kind of robust convex hulls that are robust to noise in the input um, uh, is interesting and, you know, ways to improve sparsity. Um, so the conclusion I want to leave you with is the colors of an image have this hidden geometric structure and we can use it to, you know, to find a nice, uh, to find a nice palette. We can uh, convert this to do things with generalized very centric coordinates or layers. Uh, and it's important to capture the line of grays. The, we can't just stay, we can't go to geometry and just say, okay, geometry is everything. There are some perceptual things we need to, we need to keep in mind. Um, but uh, if we do that, we can get extremely efficient and spatially smooth decompositions. Uh, and uh, you know, we can do real-time edits with all of that. All right, so I wanna thank you for listening. Uh, the GUI code and data is all available online. I wanna thank my collaborators uh, on the works I talked about, uh, particularly Jan Chow and the artists and the uh, sponsors. And um, that's, that's what I have to say about color and geometry. Thank you, Yotam, for a very amazing and really like inspiring talk. I have so many questions. Uh, I could just ask my own questions, but we got a lot of questions on the YouTube live chat and on Discord, so I'll uh, try to ask those. And we'll start with, uh, if you could uh, please stop sharing screen so we can see you. Yeah, uh, so we'll start with uh, a question for Marek. So your, uh, in your method, you say you use this Arab L to to, to do the animation of the 3D model. And for those of us who are not as familiar with the deformation literature, can you explain how this Arab L uh, is different from other deformation algorithms or like physical based simulation? Yeah, sure. So it's basically, it's, it's based on Arab, which is kind of a deformation model that encourages uh, a local rigidity of the object and so it is kind of uh, similar to, uh, so to, to some simple uh, physical, uh, physical deformation, basically. And what we actually uh, do to allow, like to, uh, to uh, enhance or, or to, make, to make this uh, physical behavior more prominent is that uh, we don't wait until the convergence of the algorithm and basically show uh, show the process of, of, the, of the convergence. So this is why it resembles uh, the physical simulation a bit more. But generally, this uh, deformation uh, may be viewed as a uh, like a uh, uh, as, as as deformation of some model that is made of made of a rubber, something like that. It's interesting. I wonder if you can mix it up and change, add like uh, like a brush where you paint different weights and uh, different regions to form differently. Sure, sure. There, there are like a many possibilities how to extend this and this this is one of them, sure. Nice. Uh, so now that Yotam had a chance to get some water or something, uh, 
So the, the, the first question we have for you is um, related to something you just brought up very briefly at the end, which is like you, uh, in, in, in your energy, you eventually you want to minimize the number of layers or the number of vertices in that uh, convex hole. And this uh, reminds me and other uh, people of sparsity and why not add that sparsity as a term to the energy directly? So in the so in the um, uh, in the optimization based approach we looked at we we did have a you know a, a sparsity term uh, we did have a sparsity term um, in there uh, it was that kind of the negative uh, negative definite sparsity term um, uh, it, you know so so you know we want spatial smoothness and we we want sparsity now when we're doing but when we do the the you know RGBXY. Uh, convex hull decompositions there and those Delaunay coordinates there. Uh, yeah, we don't have, uh, we, we lose a lot of sparsity. It's true. We do lose a lot of sparsity um, in, in the, you know, there's that two stage decomposition. So in the RGBXY to, to image pixel decomposition, we have a, a simplex with six vertices. So there could be, you know, six non zeros there. So that's, you know, six sparsity and then multiplying it with, the, with you know, with a palette uh, you know, and there we have uh, four non-zeros because we've decomposed it into 3D simplices. So we potentially, you know, I guess we potentially have like 24 non-zeros. Uh, ideally, we have very few. Ideally, we have fewer, right? So we're, de we're definitely losing sparsity there. And yeah, yeah, uh, I think um, there are probably other ways to do, I'm sure there are other ways. There's always other ways to do things. So uh, s somehow being able to explicitly incorporate sparsity into that approach uh, would be, yeah, would be very fruitful. Yeah. Okay, that, that, that's interesting. Uh, uh, Yotam, the, we got like five different questions that are the same question, basically, um, because I think many of us come from geometry and are watching your talk and are looking at this uh, uh, simplex or this like you know, geometric shape triangle mesh that you're showing in 3D. And all we're thinking is, Okay, but what can I do with it? Like, what happens if I do geometry things to that uh, mesh, right? So we have many questions, like uh, from both perspectives. For instance, what happens if I deform that mesh? What happens if I do air wrap on that mesh? What, and then from the other perspective, how does a image editing look like on that mesh representation? Like, how can what what does a filter like? What does my Instagram filter look like if I look at the RGB uh, space? So basically, what's the relationship between those two? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. 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 It's, it's, you know, it's, 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 it's very colorful. I do agree that it's like, you know, you look at it and you're like, Oh, this is just, I, I was doing geometry and usually I pick a solid color for my mesh, but now I have all of the colors. I have too many colors. I have, I mean, you can't have too many colors, but I have like, I have all of the colors being used uh, on my mesh and in my geometry. Um, yeah. I mean, uh, a lot of, uh, you know, um, image processing operations have, you can visualize them geometrically, right? You could say, okay, if I'm darkening or brightening the image then I'm kind of, you know, pulling everything towards, you know, different corners of that, of the gamut. Um, uh, if you were to, so the ARAP question, I, I, li I like that ARAP question. So like uh, what I was showing was, all right, let's, let's move one vertex around, you know, like, okay, so I can grab one vertex right. and I can, you know, I can drag it around uh, and I'm, I'm recoloring something. Right. But like, we would never, you know, in geometry processing, like we spent a lot of, you know, we, people, people spend a lot of time trying to do better than just like moving one vertex at a time. Like that sounds incredibly tedious, you know? So like, okay, so we'll do ARAP. So I move one vertex and I get a bunch of them. So maybe we could, you know, take a convex hull, not simplify it. And then like you grab a vertex and you move it and you start moving a bunch of vertices. Um, that's an interesting idea. I hadn't thought about, you know, what, what that would do. Uh, there is something that I've thought about that, um, I really want to do, and I'm reluctant to say it, you know, in a live recorded setting because, like, I really want to work on this problem. Um, but okay. uh, you know, the more you give, the more you get. That's what I always tell my uh, four-year-old, you know, uh, uh, when she doesn't <laughs> want to share. So the question that that uh, that I think is like a really interesting one is: Let's say you go to a pixel and you say, "Okay, I want this pixel, you know, or this region to change color. What is the sparsest edit in terms of the palette, or in terms of the convex hull palette?" And that's that's something that I've started to started to look at a little bit, and I really want to work, look at next. Unless you this is like a, like a really really uh, fertile ground for a lot of ideas. Like I think all of us are having uh, very similar ones. So 
doing things to that mesh and seeing what happens to the image. Um, our next question is for Marek, which is, uh, uses a little bit of machine learning words that I don't understand, but I'll do my best to translate it. Uh, this is awesome work. I wonder what would the, the limitations be to approach this problem as a 3D model sketch retrieval and then work on the manipulation of latent space with ShapeGAN or other machine learning techniques. Okay, so uh, if I understand correctly, uh, yeah, so uh, like uh, our approach is not limited to a certain like a database of shapes. And there are actually other approaches that use these, these databases to uh, like perform uh, the, the reconstruction. They can basically, uh, for example, select uh, uh, a model or a set of models that is the closest to, uh, to the sketch, for example, and deform it or, or something like that. And our approach is not limited uh, to this. Uh, it is limited only by like the, the smoothness and like uh, in the terms of the inflation, the inflation produces uh, models that are kind of round and smooth. And so, uh, yeah, it would be definitely a, a, a good idea to also try to use some deep learning techniques uh, to, uh, to create, uh, to basically perform the, uh, the 3D reconstruction. And there is also uh, some uh, previous work that uh, tries, to, uh, tries to do this. And I uh, saw some results, but uh, they uh, yet weren't so compelling for uh, like more complex examples. Okay, I see. So, uh, what about the inverse problem? Do you think, is, is there work on like, from a 3D shape getting the, the closest 2D sketch that you can inflate and get the 3D shape? Like if you okay, show me the, yeah. the elephant shape that you show in your presentation, I kind of know from which side I would do the sketch so that it looks similar, right? Right, yeah, yeah. So I'm, I'm actually not sure if, uh, not, not sure about uh, like some, some work that tries to uh, tackle exactly this, this problem, but yeah, this uh, also may be uh, like interesting and very useful. Okay. Uh... That's good. Uh, we have a question for you, Tom, from uh, Josh Polinati, a member of our lab who is also an artist that did a bunch of our uh, season one posters. So he says, speaking from experience creating artworks, many of my layers will sometimes use various blend modes like multiply or screen. Can your system detect or identify colors being used this way? Ah, yeah, great question. Yeah, there was uh, there was a work which extended this to uh, uh, you know uh, what I call exotic blend modes, but uh, you know they're they're definitely they're not that exotic. Like they're uh, any software which supports extended blend modes uh, supports them. Um, yeah, there was a there was a there was a nice paper. I feel very embarrassed that I'm blanking on the name of the author. Koyama Yuki Koyama was an author on this paper. Uh, uh, on uh, extending this to to, to handle uh, more kinds of blend modes, yeah, yeah. Okay, so it is. Uh, I guess we referred Josh to that uh, paper. Um, we have a lot more questions. We're unfortunately over time, uh, but this is what the Discord is for. So everyone listening, you can um, join in the link that. I posted on the YouTube chat. Even if you're watching this recording, you should have access to the YouTube live chat. So you can still hit that link. And uh, we'd like to end by thanking our, our speakers, Jotam Gingold and Marek Vorozhna, and the artists who designed uh, this week's amazing poster that I want to uh, pull up very quickly. Um, there you go. So we're um, really looking forward to seeing you next week to hear from Mina Kanao. Konakovic, Lukovic, and Maria Larson uh, at 8 a.m. Eastern or uh, 2 p.m. Central European time. Sounds much better than 8 a.m. Uh, thank you very much to everyone for watching and see you next week. Thank you. Bye-bye. Okay.